Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 593. That is 593 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may be finding you. I hope you are doing well. How am I? Doing fairly good all things considered I have to be honest a bit of a hectic weekend but you know we keep it moving um everything's going pretty smooth in my life for the most part I had a little checkup this past day where I had to um do a little asthma review thing every year the NHS sort of like gives you an update text if you suffer from asthma like I do which is I don't have the the serious bad bad one I have the sports related asthma where if I run or if I stay out too much and it's really you know the pollen counts really high then it kind of comes about but for the most part it doesn't it doesn't really mess up my life as much as it does to other people where essentially if they don't have national pump they may die I'm not that bad but it's still quite scary if I'm running or if I'm in a gym or something and I end up kind of having a real tightness of the of the chest it does kind of you know worry you that you're going to collapse and stuff so um, it's got nice to kind of get that review and kind of get that sorted and kind of have some reassurance that it's not as bad as you maybe think it was when you're in pain and stuff so that's pretty decent and then of course I get top up of my flipping asthma pumps which I obviously swear by and live by so that's always beneficial and then what else I do then I went out again I'm going to actually mention that also um, but many many other things I need to talk about but I'm happy to be back in the podcast seat talking to you lovely people wherever you may be I've been absolutely blasting blasting the Calvin Harris album since it dropped actually I'm a real big fan of it um, I know some people have a lot of bad things to say about Calvin Harris maybe it's too commercial and whatnot but I think for me personally I've been really lucky in that for whatever reason I've grown up not really being close up to certain musical genres especially when you consider what I look like and whatnot um, I tend to kind of be really open-minded to everything and I think mostly that has to do with maybe my upbringing maybe because the house I was in even though my parents are really religious for the most part they did play a lot of like worldly music sometimes like that was not worldly in terms of like secular but in terms of worldly like we listened to everything that came on tv especially if it was on like um a free music video whatever channel whatever it may be on song cable and whatnot we just listened to it my dad was also had a pretty decent album collection i remember back in the day when you used to listen to that kind of music my mom used to listen to some really cool music from african stuff so maybe that is a reason or it could be that because when i started to get into the whole scene and whatnot um the first thing i started doing was party promoting and then quickly when you start party promoting you start to realize that you can't book every single dj because it costs an arm and a leg and you're never going to make any money back so you start to fill up the spaces with either friends and family or you just start to play yourself to kind of save some cash and i remember when i started playing myself that's when I, which is what, more than 10 years ago, that's when I really got the bug of just listening to everything. Like I spent hours, sometimes I wouldn't even have gigs. I just spent hours at home record digging, um, finding new tunes online, buying vinyls in flipping charity shop of like random records, playing them at home, sampling them, or no, like cutting them up and putting them as podcast intros from my earlier episodes. You might have heard me taking some samples of vinyls that I recorded off my phone and then clipping them and putting them into garage band and stuff. So I've always been really open to new music or just other genres that you would wouldn't typically think someone like myself would be into so I think that really helps with my taste level in general because it allows me to listen to more and then more likely you're gonna be able to find some gems here and there even though music nowadays were to what Tory Lane said earlier it feels like nowadays this generation's music is not it's hitting as much as it was in the past but whatever in it that story for another day well it's a topic for another day I really did enjoy um, Calvin Harris's new album. It really is phenomenal. Um, it's annoying because I think Calvin Harris's album, similar to um, Beyonce's uh, Renaissance, um, didn't really get, didn't really, the singles didn't do that album any favours. Renaissance, right, by, by Beyonce. I think that Save Your Soul, so you won't break my soul. So when I first dropped, I didn't really like it personally. I said already at the beginning that I thought it wasn't that much better than what Drake had done on his album. I didn't think it was like miles better than Feelings, but I just think Beyonce is more likable. And maybe that melody kind of sits more right because it just sounds like something you would have heard in the past. It sounds like an inner city record, whereas Feelings kind of sounds a little bit more dubby, a little bit more minimal, a little bit more tech house, a little bit more deep house, which doesn't have the best reputation. So maybe that's the reason why. But regardless, I think the first couple of singles or maybe was it four singles that came out of the Calvin Harris um, Funk Wave Funk Wave Bouncers Volume 2 I thought the first few albums were terrible sorry the first few singles were terrible then the one that really caught my attention that made me think okay cool maybe um, Calvin Harris has something going on here was the track that's featuring where is it da, 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 da. why do I remember the track if I liked it so much where is it oh it's the one featuring Offset 
What's that one? That's the one here. I got it. New to you. The one featuring Normani Tinashe and Offset. That's when I suddenly started to pay attention. And I remember writing on Twitter thinking, oh, why didn't they just release that as a single? But then when I read out the names, I was like, oh, no wonder why. Because those names, Normani, Tinashe and Offset aren't the like AA list names that he'd want to the lead singles and I'm imagining when it comes to a Calvin Harris album there's a lot of politics involved in you know hands you have to shake and backs you have to pat and whatnot to get certain people on the album or whatever or how they have released singles I'm sure there's some politics involved so he probably couldn't put that as a lead single but I thought New To You track number six on the album is way better than any single that came before that personally for me um, but then the album itself the intro alone that's like what I don't know how long it is it's like 50 minutes 50 seconds or something 40 yeah, 50 seconds no 40 seconds actually it's really nice it sets the mood straight away it's sort of like you know you, you can imagine being like on an on a on a stranded on an island by yourself like just this is the first type of music that plays as you just wash up on shore and then it gets into new money featuring 21 savage who absolutely rips it potion with a dua lipa and young fug is an impeccable combination young fugs versus incredible we really do miss his voice even though he's in prison or in jail now at the moment for pretty serious crimes you know free YSL regardless but yeah young fugs definitely missed his voice out there um i thought the woman of the year track featuring calvin harris stefan don coilere and who else is on it let me press the actual see if there's muscles on it. Is I missed them? Steph London, um, Coyle Ray, and who else did I say? Chloe, sorry. And that's it. Yeah, those three. I thought that was a really good album. A really good song, sorry. Then I thought it kind of fell off. I didn't really like the Obsessed coming after that track. I thought the sequel was going That was a bit weird. Um, then obviously the New To You, the track I'm re a really big fan of. The Ready or Not track with Buster Rhymes is cool, but not really for me. The Stay With Me track is great with Justin Justin Timberlake, even though I'm not a fan of Justin Timberlake nowadays. So already there's some solid tracks on there, but my standout one is definitely um, Somebody Else featuring Georgia Smith and Little Dirk, mostly because I'm not a fan of Georgia Smith. I think she's a bit mediocre. I think she's one of the artists out there who kind of does does get the whatever pretty privilege that does exist in the, in music i think for the most part her albums are incredibly lackluster um, i think her features weirdly enough on other people's records are way better than her actual bodies of work i don't think she's put together a really solid or cohesive body to work body to work body of work as an album i still think people like um what's her name the girl that i was obsessed with playing her album a lot of times uh oh, fuck i don't remember people's names a lot do i uh something rose what was her name that was playing a lot of it on the album here is it ruby rose not ruby is it ruby rose is that her name i can't name can't be ruby rose what was the lady's name that i liked was it ruby rose no it's not ruby rose is the model right yeah i'm talking about something else what was her fucking name oh damn it i forgot the name but there was an album an rb album that i was playing a lot of um but is it baby rose i think it might be baby rose maybe it's that let's see if it's baby rose it's probably baby rose yeah it is baby rose so i thought someone like a baby rose who I've been a fan of for a while, who has an album called To Myself, which came out in 2020, which I think is phenomenal. Definitely an underrated album. Definitely didn't get the respect or the praise that it probably should have got. But someone like that is a way better artist, I think, R&B-wise than a, you know, than a Georgia Smith. I'm not really a fan of her. But regardless, I think she smashes it on that Calvin Harris track. Like, she really, really delivers big times. Like, her vocals are impeccable. So are the lyrics. And then Lil Dirt comes out with really a great, great bar too. So a great verse that he kind of lends on that track as well. Um, and yeah, I just like everything about that track. I really, really do. Um, and I like the fact that they put effort, because I think sometimes in the past, there was this thing that a lot of rappers did where they were just kind of phone in those kind of verses for those kind of commercial acts. And it wouldn't necessarily be a verse that even really spoke uh, to the tune it was just a random verse they kind of pulled out of their bum that they didn't use for their own album and put on the song but i felt like little dirk actually sat down put pen to paper and actually put this verse together for Kevin harris of course he probably knows in his team that's a big look but that verse i thought was banging and yeah the rest of the album is pretty solid too but definitely check out um Kevin harris's funk wave bounces volume two if you've not already i do recommend you check it out i'm a really big fan of it i know it's a bit commercial i know it's a bit cringy and a little bit bait but trust me if you're into good disco -y type in indie dance type funk bop type whatever type that music is if you're into better versions of what harry styles does then check this out in my opinion i think it's a far better version of that kind of sound that he's trying to go for that's just my opinion the other thing i did this weekend also is i caught some l's of course on the sneakers app as per usual i tried to get myself a pair of the tom Sachs. um general purpose shoe the gps shoe and unfortunately as per usual even the restock i wasn't fortunate enough to get a pair even the bloody restock and um it's annoying it's frustrating but i have to be honest the process and the sign up to do it on the tom Sachs site was pretty 
you know pretty easy and pretty okay of a service to use maybe the other thing that they don't do is that when you sign up on the online form it's a pretty easy to kind of go on and it's all kind of plain text type of style so it's not really you know f flubbing you around with unnecessary graphics and animation and shit it's just the images of the shoe and then no it's just actually a page where you just fill in the form so even the image of the, of the shoe so it's all plain text you fill in your details location size blah blah contact details and they only contact you if it's successful, which is nice because you don't get that kind of L email about, oh yeah, you, you didn't get the shoe, which is kind of which is kind of worse than getting than not getting it. Do you know what I mean? Like it's kind of worse. I don't know why, because you look at the email, you think, oh Tom Sachs email emailed me, Tom Sachs store, and you automatically think your brain that you might have got a chance and you scroll your eyes across to the subject line and it says, you know, unsuccessful or something. It's just a bit annoying. But I guess it's nice to be informed. But I do like the fact that they only shoot they only email you if you've been picked, if I'm not mistaken, because I didn't get an email telling me I didn't get picked. Maybe I maybe I got one later, but at the time that everyone was getting picked, I didn't get picked. And then of course Tom Sachs himself on his Instagram account made his little update where he said the following sold out studio research stock and new colorways to let to come later this year so i like the fact that tom sachs um with this collaboration with nike right um this uh, nike craft collaboration that they put together they're going out of their way to number one make a shoe that's clearly meant to be worn with the mars yards that are, i don't have them to hand here to show you but with the mars yards that i wore i wear all the time i'm actually going to put a picture up on the screen right now of the mars yards i have and the condition that they're in and you'll see that i actually wear my stuff every single day to the point now these shoes have turned into my gym shoes they're my de facto gym shoes i don't wear anything else to the gym apart from my mars yards and i'm probably going to get another pair um, and then wear those also out and then probably turn them into gym shoes later on down the line. So don't don't cry, all right? But that's just what I do. But I like the fact that that was always a plan. The original Mars Yard, the midsole that he put together was basically put together with the purpose of attracting more dirt. It was meant to be the kind of midsole that kind of, I guess it doesn't have a particular finish on it. I'm not sure exactly how it's, what, it's composed, what it's composed of, but I'm assuming it has, doesn't have a finish on it that wouldn't sort of not attract dust or attract dirt. You know what I mean, it's not something that you could easily wipe away with like a wet wipe and stuff. It does kind of stick to it. And even, and I think for the most part, they did a good job because all their press releases, I mean, their press shots that they did, quote unquote, media shots, whatnot, they were all done with pairs that were clearly seeded out to people who wore them. So they kept putting that kind of, um, what do you call it? How do you call that? Uh, that subliminal message in your head that these should be worn. You never saw a picture of like some shiny influencer, you know, standing in some clubs or somewhere without bending them, looking cool. It was always somebody kind of working that was cool or that was interesting. That was kind of the, at the forefront of their field doing actual real work. You know what I mean? When they were kind of wearing a pair. So I think that kind of set the precedent. And they've done the same thing with this general purpose shoe. Even just in a name, this is a general purpose shoe. It's a shoe that kind of, you know, fit for, fit for general purpose. It applies across the board and throughout the entire release Tom Sachs has been saying hey these are going to be released plenty there's going to be plentiful of these they're going to keep coming out in different colors I think we've already seen a yellow and a gray pair that's been leaked online and stuff so clearly there's more colors to come and he's keep reiterating to everybody don't pay crazy money for the research because I guess as flattering as it must be to see on StockX that the Mars Yard that I have the one that's absolutely beat up it's nice to see on StockX that they are selling for a crazy amount I think they're like last time i checked it was like 5k or something in my size it must be a little bit disappointing because you also want everyone to wear them you also want everyone to have a chance to buy them and i guess you know with his network and with his fan base that covers kind of a broad a wide breadth of people for the most part because i think he's maybe i would say the number one kind of artist within the scene at the moment when it comes to streetwear i think he's definitely surpassed somebody like a um takashi murakami or even like a daniel ashim i think with the with the quality of work he puts in with the fact that it's so kind of quote unquote accepted accessible with how he kind of carries himself with the whole studio i think he's definitely the kind of number one dude so you can imagine the kind of people who'd want to wear them right they kind of cover a whole breath and i think i remember when i first dropped the first thing i realized when i was in london uh, when i had my pair was that i saw many people that i generally wouldn't see wearing those type of sneakers wearing the mars yards the original ones and i also remember getting more compliments off of that shoe than any shoe i've ever worn the only other shoe I got more compliments off of was when the first sort of like Yeezy 300s came out. And I remember, what did I have randomly? I might have had like a Turtle Doves. I don't know what I had. What what what, my, what Yeezy did I have? I had a Yeezy when it first came. I forgot which one it was, but I remember that being, maybe it was a Wave Run I'm talking about, the 700. Maybe it was one like that. When I originally dropped, I remember that being one of the shoes that I got a lot of comments from normies, quote unquote, who generally don't give a shit about fashion and clothes and shit, who were kind of giving me compliments saying, hey, this is a really nice shoe, man. I really would wish I had a pair myself. 
So I guess um, because of that, he's generally leading into it and not kind of catered it to the influences and stuff. Because even when you see online, you don't see the usual glitterati of people like the ASAP bars and stuff promoting this stuff because they're not glitzy they're not really flashed they're just you know they're a bit basic in terms of what they kind of look like and you, all you see are real people I, I, I would say real people but you see people who actually I say work right not like influencer work like work as in like they have studios they're a part of a corporation they maybe you know have a gallery they maybe have a little store they maybe have a small client list that they actually work on five to seven days a week. Like people are actually out there putting in a graft. I don't know people I see wearing these day to day. And I really want a pair too, because you know, they just look awesome. And I think they'd go with a lot of the stuff that I have in my wardrobe. But unfortunately this weekend I caught an L. So I have to kind of go back to the drawing board and hope, hope that um, next time I'll be far more lucky. Now, moving on, I had them. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm lucky. I was on the screen. Now, moving on. I had some interesting things to say on Twitter. Or oh, I had some interesting things. That sounds a bit um, um, self congratulatory self congratulatory, and also like I'm sucking my own pee pee. But I thought when I saw this news on Hypebeast that I was maybe the only person who kind of had these reservations. And I guess maybe in general, when it comes to streetwear stuff and it comes to scene stuff, because it's all, because it's kind of partly about how good you are and about how hardworking you are and about how resilient you are. It is also a game of like, who you know right and who you're friends with because that kind of helps in terms of allowing you to kind of network with the right people get brought in with the, to, to the right spaces to be even even to be able to even to be even given a chance to display your talents because i know like myself i know for myself sorry rewind that i had a really hard time kind of breaking in because when i first started i was quite i wouldn't say abrasive but i was pretty hell bent on annoying people i would say maybe because it's the i was just young and i thought i knew everything um i thought i deserved to fucking be tinker hatfield straight away i thought i deserved to be fraser cook straight away you know those kind of dumb things that you think in your head right and when you're like 19 you think you know everything you, you think you can solve all the issues and whatnot when clearly there's issues bit way bigger than what my level of understanding was but there's also a kind of annoyance that i felt that there was this real big there was this over <sighs> There was an overemphasis placed, I felt like, on who you knew. And it was too annoying to me because I knew that I couldn't play that game. So for me, the annoying part was that I can't play that game because it's just not in my personality to be like a suck up or to be like fake friends with people. I just don't have it in me, unfortunately, for myself. I don't take that as a credit and make myself think I'm bitter than anyone. I just can't do it. I always thought it was disappointing because at the end of the day, that's not the most important aspect. You would imagine being actually good at what you do, being hard work and having some form of resilience should be the way forward, right, in that kind of field. But sometimes if you just network correctly, you can put yourself in a position that you don't necessarily deserve and then work up to some sort of good enough level. So I guess because of that, people tend to not really share their opinions or really say what they actually feel about things. But obviously still people kind of vote with their wallets, vote with their feet. And for the most part, whether we're thinking even behind closed doors, it kind of gets relayed in the open market. I mean, there's no hiding from that. But then when I saw this news, I was kind of a little bit like grossed out and disappointed. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to lie about this. So this is courtesy of a uh, hype beast. It says the following Tremaine Emery teases the return of Pyrex vision, the resurrection Ablo Caravaggio tears. Now, if you're familiar with um, Virgil Abloh law, RIP the great, you would know that Pyrex vision was Virgil Abloh's first dilly dance or first dipping of his toes into fashion or into streetwear. Let's say streetwear first of all, and then he kind of led into, into fashion. But effectively, this is the first brand that he launched that caused a real big stir in the streetwear community. I think this was the brand that effectively made Virgil Abloh the, um, the kind of uh, de facto enemy of the scene for the most part. I remember speaking to a lot of people when I was working at the place I was at before where I sort of met Virgil briefly when I was doing that online streetwear course. And I was speaking to kind of, and this was kind of like after he kind of stopped doing this and was kind of launching into his fashion brand that he did Off-White and stuff for the first few seasons. Part of the reason why a lot of these other streetwear big dogs who kind of then went out of their way to suck up to him when he was really successful at Louis Vuitton, why they were saying no to him to be part of the course that I was trying to get them involved in to be mentors was because of the Pirates vision. They felt like Pirates vision went against everything to do with streetwear. It was priced really high. Um, 
the inspiration from it was maybe a little bit i don't know surface level i don't know what what people thought maybe the name i don't know but people just didn't like what he did there they didn't like how he put it together and i think maybe the rugby flannels also kind of rubbed people up the wrong way the fact that he went and bought all these rugby flannels that were like 60 to i think 60 bucks or something like that i think he said in the interview um he basically um he basically dead stock no he basically bought them whatever that was left so that they weren't anymore because I guess they weren't reissuing it with whatever that was left on the racks and then he printed the pirate version on the back of the 23 and then sold them for $600 right and this is also maybe the time that he was kind of being a bit of a troll online and attacking people saying you know fashion is um what do you say um designs a fresher scam or something you know he was just being a little bit of a troll and being a little bit anti being a little bit counterculture right and also just kicking up a fuss which you should do even in a streetwear brand you should be making t-shirts that say pharrell can't skate and kind of winding people up a little bit do you know what i mean that's what that's the kind of name of the game i think a little bit especially when you're starting to kind of cause a bit of a stir that being said the brand obviously got um if i remember the name was the name of the brand as well who was that was that asap torvi was that asap nas i gave the name i don't know but there was some sort of so whoever started the name wasn't um, uh, Virgil I think they gave him this name for that right or was it Off-White whatever it was doesn't matter Pyrex Vision he did it for a bit he had to stop it because the brand the manufacturer Pyrex ended up you know um, sending him a cease and desist or maybe threatening to sue and then that's when he shifted into Off-White and then you know the rest is history but me personally I just think um, teasing a return of Pyrex Vision under the moniker of Dunning Tears from Tremaine Emery I just think is a bit distasteful that's just my own personal opinion. Now, there could be more to this story. And the fact that Virgil Abloh and um, Tremaine were clearly very close friends. They clearly were very close collaborators. Um, and there's clearly more to their story that I don't actually know because I was never around them, those guys a lot. I maybe saw them together maybe once or twice, if that. So cool, understandable. But I just think... The fact that this guy hasn't been dead yet for a year yet. It's not even been a year since Virgil Abloh untimely passing, right? Um, the passing that touched a lot of people within, you know, streetwear, within fashion, within the wider community, within culture overall. And the fact that he was kind of like just about to start getting to his um, bag in terms of, you know, his creative output and his work and his projects and stuff. It was a real shame that he was, that he passed in the way that he passed, especially because no one knew that he was going through his health difficulties. So all that kind of baggage around it, the fact that he was going through that tumultuous time just before he passed where he was getting a little bit, you know, he was kind of getting cancelled online for the whole Black Lives Matter stuff. And there was a lot of kind of bent up emotion there. And then, of course, the criticism he was getting from fashion people and, you know, not really recognising his work or not really wanting to give him his flowers while he's around. So there's a lot of kind of raw emotions around it, I think. Again, this is from a, somebody that worked with him very briefly, like a small drop of working, not even anything close to what these guys have done. But even I felt that in terms of like, damn, and I remember being like one of the main guys who was like, I would say main guys champion, about one of the people that was sort of like champion and champion his name and also kind of saying, hey, he deserves to be in these kind of conversations that they're putting him in, even if you don't like his work. I still think he deserves to be in those kind of conversations to the point where, if I'm not mistaken, that role that I actually took on to be part, to be like the co-producer of that online streetwear course, the whole reason why I applied to that company is because I got told by a little birdie that he was actually going to be the lead tutor. So I kind of wanted to do that course knowing full well the contacts that I have, the knowledge that I have at the scene that I'll be able to be a great resource and kind of plug some holes in terms of getting some cool people involved but also that I get the opportunity to work next to this guy who had this even at the time I thought was a crazy output right his output was insane it went against everything that I kind of I kind of was not taught but sort of kind of learned by I was the most in streetwear on the scene where you don't really you know show your work um you always show pdf and line sheets of stuff that you're thinking of doing you never ship stuff um, you never put your money where your mouth is. There's a little kind of kind of stuff, right? You took a big game, but then Virgil just came in and just started dumping, like boom, boom, one after the other, like project, 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 sell, up, sell, up, sell. like he just didn't stop, and that eventually got him where he was, you know, before he passed. So I'm as invested in this story as anybody because I was a fan. Do you know what I mean? And I still am a fan to this day. I still, you know, for the most part, when I'm about to do a creative project, I love to put on the old Virgil Abloh interview in the background and just listen to it as I'm doing my thing. It's just something I like to do. But I just think this is quite distasteful, my own opinion. Now, there could be more to this story. I'm sure 
you know, they've gotten permission for this. You know, we're looking on the screen now, our flannel kind of taking, you know, a bit of a nod to what Virgil did beforehand that says Pyrex with number 45, which is meant to be a nod to Jordan. He's returned back to the game. He saw the number 45 and then of course, you know, the original shirt had 23 on it. So there's that link and then the tears at the bottom and the name itself is pretty cool. If you just think about it on the surface level, Pyrex tears, I think that's pretty cool name, but I just think it's distasteful and I'm not really a fan of it at all in the slightest. Um, I just think the guy hasn't passed, you know, his passing hasn't been long enough for those kind of things to go about. I know most likely he did get permission from the estate to do this for sure. They're way more closer to Virgil Abloh's, you know, late wife and children and family members than I would ever be. So if they say it's fine, then it's fine. But I think as a fan, um, you're allowed to maybe raise your concerns and say, I just don't like post, what is, how, how do you pronounce it? Is it post homus, right? Post homus releases. I just hate them. I think Prince was a big, um, Prince also agreed with that kind of notion that he was never a fan of it. And then in the end, they ended up kind of going against his wishes and trying their best to kind of tarnish his legacy by bringing out as many releases as possible after he passed. And I look at people like, you know, Jean-Michel Basquiat and his legacy and how it's been, I think, somewhat ruined because of the licensing that was, you know, done to his work and his likeness. I look at the stuff with like Keith Herring and the amount of crappy you see out there with people wearing. I look at the stuff that are leaving at some like a Piet Mondrian. Had some, the other day I saw some girl at some tech house party yeah, I went to wearing a jacket that you know some Piet Mondrian s kind of jacket and I was like does she even know like again not in a kind of like I'll use into metal sort of stuff but come on do you even know who this artist is and his branch has been cheapened by some bomber jacket you can buy in Primark I just this is what you don't want to see and I don't know if this would be maybe an agreement they already had maybe this is kind of one of Virgil's kind of last hurrahs in terms of like you know you would never think I'd be into this sort of stuff but here I am saying no you know take my stuff rip it make as many copies as you want you know, make your own tributes. I don't care, you know, because at the end of the day, his name is still ringing off the back of this. But I just think in terms of tact and stuff, I wouldn't personally like this for myself. No, I personally just don't like it from afar. Um, I just think it's a little bit, it's a little bit gross for me personally. Um, but again, who knows? This, I could be proven wrong. This whole thing could be tied to a project that is tied to some sort of um, community outreach thing. It could be going to unrepresented communities. It could be, you know, something that kind of leads to a bigger project that kind of touches more people and inspires more people. I don't know. I'm sure there's more to it, but if you're just going to put out two posts that I see now on the screen, one of them features an up close picture of a hoodie with a, a picture from of Caravaggio here that's been enlarged to cover the whole entire front. And then you've got another picture, of course, with the back of the flannel and not give any more information than the resurrection, Ablo Caravaggio tears, and you've got returning with the 45. If you're going to be that vague, I just have to assume, I just have to interpret what I see on the screen. And from what I see on the screen, I don't like it. It could be, again, I'm sure, because this Tremaine guy seems to be a fairly level-headed, rational, considerate, compassionate type of dude. I'm sure this isn't done with any sort of malice, so it's not a criticism on the guy at all. And from the times I've met him, he's only been nice, courteous, and, you know, good-natured, despite some of the people that he hangs around with being absolute cunts. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He's always been really, really nice. It's just... I just don't like this this thing alone. And, I'm, and I think it's cool to say you don't like it without it kind of coming across that you're going to ruffle some feathers or people are not going to be happy and it's going to you know tarnish your name and shit. That's just a bit lame. I mean, if my work is good, my work is good. It shouldn't matter that I didn't like a shirt. But I just don't like this collaboration. I just think it's a little bit tasteless for me personally. But maybe I'm in the minority. So I'd like to know what you guys think in the comments down below. Um, let me know what you think. Do you think the Pyrex Tears number 45, the resurrection of Pyrex Vision, Virgil Abloh's first kind of dip into the kind of streetwear scene, this resurrection that Tremaine is doing from Dead in Tears, do you think it's actually, do you think it's tasteful? Do you think it honors his legacy? Um, and maybe I'm talking completely out of my ass and I don't know what I'm talking about. Let me know in the comments. What is what they're saying here? And Hypebeast comments are not the best comments to kind of, you know, glean on because they're usually overly negative, but let's see what they say here. Because I haven't actually read them what they say the hypebeast comment says the following recycle the dead milk the dead with 16 upvotes and then the comment that replies and it said nothing like making money off your homie that just died less than eight months ago Yeesh. okay i didn't put it that harshly but hey another person says here the term turning in his grave doesn't apply to virgil the guy's been turning so much it's more like a washing machine ouch another one says my guy discovered basic ass caravaggio and thought it made him a creative clownery now at the time at the time though, when Virgil did the Caravaggio hoodie, it was pretty cool. I remember seeing it. I remember seeing the, the, the that shoot that they did with ASAP Mob and the whole video around it was really cool. Let's not lie. That whole fashion film thing that he created with them was brilliant. 
I thought the hoodie was really sick and I thought the t-shirt was sick and the shorts. I liked everything about that. And I remember seeing a performance of, was it ASAP Rocky? I don't know what he was performing. This not not what he's wearing. It was like a, it was like an old one when the when it first dropped. I think he was wearing the all white ones. I wasn't even maybe available for sale. I'm not too sure. It was a white one. Maybe it had white font. And I thought that looked disgustingly good. So that was pretty sick at the time. But maybe now it's a little bit um, lame because everybody essentially copied what Virgil did. That's the irony of it. It's been done so often that kind of like you know, um, what was the artist that I like that did that sort of similar painting? Uh, Bronzino, right? There's another guy too who I was really liking at the time when I was doing art in school who did the similar sort of, uh, you know, Passion of the Christ kind of style paintings called Bronzino who had a really good painting that I was kind of thinking I put on the shirt when Virgil dropped this and that was, that was kind of forward thinking but now maybe it's a little bit, you know, a little bit lame. So I kind of get that but I think, you know, the guy created it first so he can, you know, whatever, recycle it if he wants. Um, and another one said, now you're tripping. This is great tribute to Virgil, the 23 to the 45. Nice, cool. Someone likes it there. Another person says, this ain't Pyrex. This is just Virgil's homie getting approval from Virgil Estate to stamp his name and collect a paycheck, which is kind of like a backhanded compliment, isn't it? <laughs> a little bit. Another person here says, nah, buddy. Another person says, nobody asks for this. Another person says, for grave rot. <laughs> oh, this is pretty brutal. Another person puts in, in quotation marks, for grave rolling. Another person says here, I feel like, play pray for paris needs to be re-released so yeah so I'm pretty you know com most of the comments are kind of going against it what he's trying to do i'm sure his instagram comments are more positive because they're all his friends so that's nice you're kind of going to get some nice praise that way but for me i'm just not a fan of it but i'd like to know what you guys think in the comments down below let me know let me know oh actually you know what I haven't spoken about my glasses, have I? I'm sure some of you have noticed the change in the glasses that I usually wear because usually when I do my podcast, I have these um, white, uh, what are they called again? Oh, I forgot the name of the fucking shape of the glasses. I'll try to put up on the screen if I remember the name, but regardless, they're like a Kurt Cobain style, um, you know, round glasses that I wear that have sort of like a white frame with black lenses. And they've been doing me pretty you know they've been serving me pretty well or oh, they i think they called clout glasses clout goggles i think at the time because when they were sort of really popular was what 2015 right that kind of playboy car era they kind of called them clout glasses because people just wear them for the sake of wearing them um because they were cool and trendy and people wanted to pretend like they were into flipping nirvana and whatnot but then over time you know other things kind of took over and i just kind of wear them to be kind of ironically silly because they're ridiculously lame and they're not the coolest thing to wear anymore but i just think it's quite funny for me to sit on here criticizing things in culture calling out things saying this is crap saying this is good when i've got the most uh basic bitch kind of glasses on the you know of all time so whatever now i've got another pair of glasses that are probably a little bit more on point with what's going on nowadays in fashion with the whole like y2k trend and these are essentially a copy of the of, of a pair of Balenciaga glasses. i'm not sure what the name of them actually are but i actually plan to hopefully get a legit pair of these Balenciaga glasses when i eventually do get paid but this is essentially like a copy of them i way to see if they fit my face because I have a very round face, even when I was really, really skinny. My face doesn't really hollow out as much as I'd like it to. I would I would like more aggressive flipping cheekbones, like a flipping ID or Vice or, you know, Days Magazine kind of model. But unfortunately, that's not in my nature. It just doesn't happen to me. It gets more obviously square, but it just doesn't suck in as much as I want it to suck in. But anyway, we move. Um, imagine that the surgery where they can make you have like sucked in things. I remember that'll be mad, innit? Uh, maybe they just exaggerate the cheekbones, but I don't think they can make it go in dent. Eh, doesn't matter. Um, moving on. So when it comes to glasses, my number one, my face is really round. And number one, I have a really big, but also a small face. I think this this bit is small, but for some reason, my the radius of my head is huge. Uh, <laughs> so not all glasses suit me. Like for instance, um, wafers, right? Typical Ray-Ban wafers, right? They just don't fit me. I wish they could look good on me. I remember seeing Casey Neistat's early vlogs and him wearing a pair and doing that whole spray paint thing that he does when he scratches off the paint on the front and it looks sick. And I really want that for me. But when I put them on, they just don't suit my face, unfortunately. So I have to kind of get really big kind of framed glasses and fortunately for me the late in the recent years it felt like everybody was making like oversized glasses like glasses that were just kind of you know three percent bigger taking a virtual blur kind of three percent rule they kind of made them a little bit bigger um and that kind of grandiose sort of like hollywood that kind of like Hollywood anti-paparazzi sort of frame came in where you can kind of hide behind these massive shields on your face so that kind of helped but when I saw these glasses I thought oh these are a little bit more 
I would say in the style of like an Oakley, right? A little bit more of an action, sort of like, you know, ready to run, ready to flip in, jump on the latest bus to go to the trendiest area, to go into the shop and buy the whatever drink everyone buys at the moment and go and dance side to side. I mean, they, they look a little bit fast. So you imagine these kind of fast wraparound glasses wouldn't necessarily fit me or suit me. But I think judging by what can I see on the mirror and stuff, they suit me pretty well. They look pretty decent not the most amazing in the world but for what they are for them being like a pair of what three dollar fifty or four dollars um copies from aliexpress they're pretty decent in terms of getting the look across and now they make me a lot more confident when i want to then go out and buy the actual legit pairs from balenciaga which i'm definitely going to get because i want the other colors because as much as i like the silver color and i've got another pair also i've got this pair where is it Yeah, I've got these. So I've got this one. This is sort of kind of like an Oakley style kind of glasses. And then I've got these ones also that I want to show you. That I got too. So I've got these these off. And then I've got these. These kind of more wrapper. These ones I think most of you have kind of seen people wearing these sort of glasses. So what do you guys what do you guys think of these sunglasses? This whole Y two K trend, um, which obviously is a nod to you know the early two thousands fashion. Um, think of you know von Dutch studded belts, um, you know baggy jeans, small t shirts, almost crop top style. Uh, think of very kind of a cut and paste sort of like tattoos think of really trashy euro trash type of music um think of loads of lights loads of colors think of that kind of stuff right and this is where you kind of get so i want you guys to let me know in the comments below what do you think of this trend do you think it looks redacted do you think it looks cool um would you actually wear them yourself and again i'll actually put the link in the description if you want to get a pair of these yourself but they're, they're fairly decent in terms of getting you the look but again, the, the real is always better than the fake. So I'll definitely end up getting the, the legit pair to kind of see how they work. But for somebody who kind of finds it very difficult to get some decent kind of sunglasses for themselves, I'm really kind of happy with how these look. So yeah, not, not complaining. Not complaining in the slightest. Okay, we're back again because I had some little issues with my OBS in terms of getting my bloody hotkeys to work. So if anyone out there that's using um, Macs and they're using OBS and they have hotkeys enabled, I've gone through a couple of threads and tried to kind of make it work, but it didn't necessarily sort out the issue. If you have any solutions that aren't changing the hotkeys to Q, D and M, um, that aren't kind of reapplying the permissions because I've done all that run off all the basic kind of troubleshooting methods. If there's any other things out there that I've missed in terms of hockey's no BS, please let me know. I'd love to kind of get it sorted so I don't need to kind of keep clicking and editing my podcast all the time because it just makes the uploading process really difficult and really long personally. But anyway, moving on. So I went out over the weekend and I went to a couple of parties, right? Obviously Inferno and then another random party that I went to that wasn't the best. I'm not going to mention the name because I don't want to get anyone in trouble and stuff. But in general, I had a pretty interesting chat with some people on a WhatsApp group that I'm a part of that I'm not going to mention as well because I don't want to, you know, bait up anybody's names and stuff. And we were talking in general just about dance music and clubbing, etc. And the conversation somehow steered itself around um, queer spaces and kind of, you know, the it's amazing parties that whole scene is putting on anybody under the kind of queer LGBTQ plus community. I feel like in London is really smashing. I feel like they put on the best productions in terms of a party, you know, kind of in a quintessential way where you kind of get dressed up, you make an effort. I don't make an effort, unfortunately, but you know, people that actually do make an effort, put makeup on, pick amazing outfits. I feel like, um, the queer scene is doing it the best. There's no one else doing it better. I think everyone else is sort of like doing the stereotypical or the typical, not stereotypical, the typical sort of like booking the best DJ out there who sells the most tickets, putting them on a flight and hoping that thing sells out and then just having people dance in the club that's already kind of pre-designed for you. But at least with the queer scene, they're actually you know, going in with their own people. They're essentially some, in some cases they're getting their, they're hiring their own security staff. They may be retraining the ones that are already on board or giving them some guidelines of how to kind of treat their patrons. They're trying to change the interior of the space that they're using. They're coming up with cool concepts. I the one I went to recently just had this idea about a whole like, um, 
like a strip club thing they had dancers dancing on a pole and they had this um fake money that you'd give that could be exchanged for tokens like some really cool and interesting things kind of going on with how they kind of view clubbing in a way to kind of go out there and enjoy yourself in this quote-unquote dance scene dance music scene right they're doing some cool things but obviously with this kind of success comes people like myself right who you would describe as a regular cis gendered male right a regular straight dude or some will describe me as a bro which i don't think i don't think i'm a bro i think that's a bit disparaging to describe me as a bro but also i don't think being described as a bro is a bad thing i feel like there's, a, there's too many of these sort of like derogatory terms being thrown out there i think for the most part we are all kind of all one because you know when the clubs close when the government come down and it's like a like a like a pile of bricks we're all gonna cry do you know what i mean it wouldn't matter if you're a tech house bro or if you're a you know a queer person that kind of parties at these up events i'm talking about you're all gonna feel the effects of it so i feel like we kind of have to move to a more unified beat of a drum personally for me but you know that's unlikely going to happen but anyway moving on I feel like with the success of those kind of industry, with the success of those parties in those scenes, it's only going to invite more quote unquote normies, more bros, and more people that don't exactly ascribe to the lifestyle choices or to the lifestyle or to the sexual preferences or to the identity that all those people do, you know, subscribe to. So with that, I feel like there's going to be a little bit. There's going to need to be more conversation around conduct and how you behave in those spaces because even for myself being an avid fan of techno being an avid fan of djing culture in general being an avid fan of dance music being an avid fan of music and being somebody that was kind of my first sort of dilly dance into dance music scene and nightclubs and whatnot was through tech through disco sorry not techno disco that was my first kind of dilly dance into it italo disco indie dance uh new disco all that stuff is what i kind of got into and if you listen to those sort of tunes they're very gay right they're very kind of out there they're very outlandish they're very loud i remember going to the first horse meat disco parties when they were launching obviously obviously was um an addict of the love fever parties that they put on back in the day r.i.p if you remember if you know you know love fever one of the best sort of disco nights out there so i'm very familiar with that whole entire scene and its history i'd read up and watched many documentaries about the whole disco scene in the early 80s especially in new york with you know the esteemed clubs like you know studio 54 and whatnot going forward so i'm very familiar with that and of course comes with that the whole entire sort of lgbtq plus umbrella you could say basically invented that entire genre some of the biggest djs in that scene were essentially gay or identified as queer so clearly i'm aware of that whole thing but even for myself going into predominantly i would say queer spaces lgbtq plus spaces has been a little bit of a mind shift in terms of how i conduct myself because i know that I'm the guest there i know that this party isn't made for me it's made for people that you know for the most part don't feel comfortable or feel um seen or feel accepted or feel welcomed in kind of conventional nightclub spaces so they create these other nights that they do in unconventional spaces or spaces that aren't necessarily taken up by the regular sort of person so they can feel safe in their you know safe space quote unquote so i understand when i go into these spaces that i kind of have to somewhat mind my p's and q's and for the most part mind my business right the girls aren't there for me the guys aren't there for me no one is there for me they're all there for themselves and i kind of have to just enjoy the music and just kind of do my own thing but of course when you go into these spaces for the first time you have to kind of i won't say train yourself but you kind of have to get used to you can not used to you kind of have to work up to that point it's not something you kind of can kind of click into straight away because especially if you've got bad habits of kind of going into sore spaces and getting high getting drunk you can kind of fumble around and make a fool of yourself make the people in there completely you know uncomfortable and sort of ruin their fun and i remember for me the first time i sort of noticed that was when i maybe went to Bergheim maybe the first or second time on my own I think when you're with friends you don't really notice things you're just kind of in your own little scene you're kind of or when you meet friends there in the kind of club like Bergheim you tend to just sort of make your own party you're not really seeing people you're just kind of doing your own thing with your own little group and having a whale of a time but I remember when I first 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 went on my own which might have been the third or fourth time I remember just standing in the main Bergheim floor at the back where if you know about Bergheim, you know it's the main floor and they've got these sort of like platforms towards the back and then they've got this sort of like rail sort of thing that you can just rest on and you can just watch. So I just remember just sitting there for an hour just like fully sober just staring at everything thinking wow this place is amazing kind of soaking in because i like to do that when i first go in there going there completely stone sober just on water and just sort of soak it in and then go and work your way up to the whole you know gear you want to take whatever it may be. And I remember standing there and then at the right at the front, for whatever reason, I guess whatever, however the light shone, you know, they got great lighting people in there. It seemed to shine on some 
girl, I would assume. I don't know how they identify themselves, but a girl and there, and she was topless, right? And she was wearing this amazing kind of like leather PZ, PVC like, I would say they were kind of like hot pants sort of thing. They were great. The way they just fit, everything was amazing. And she had great tattoos as well. And then for whatever reason, the shot latched on somebody else and they were wearing, they were topless too. And that was latched on somebody else and they were kind of with a fit just thing. I just remember thinking, wow, I never, I actually never noticed this before. I guess before you're just in your own world of wrapped up or too high, you don't notice these things. And now on my own, I'm noticing it. So I'm just kind of staring, not even staring at them, just staring, not even staring in their eyes, just staring kind of at their kind of frame overall, the sort of silhouette of these people. And I remember straight away after staring for a little bit, but not even realized I was staring, the, someone caught my eye, like the kind of our eyes crossed because clearly, you know, if you're staring at somebody, they can feel you in the back of the head burning. And then suddenly she started covering up and I was like, oh no, like clearly I kind of looked away. I was like, damn, like I've now made her be seen. Do you know what I mean? I've kind of made them feel uncomfortable because I was kind of leering or staring or whatnot. It wasn't my attention. I was just kind of looking out into the distance of these crowd of Bobby's bodies moving around and the light kept shining on these people for some reason. And it made, then I soon realized, like, oh, yeah, I keep forgetting, as great as this club is, this is still a club that was founded on queer LGBTQ plus kind of like principles, right? I mean, Berkheim, it's kind of founded on that. So, or the entire scene basically in, 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 in Berlin has been founded on that, unless you go to like a house party. For the most part, it's kind of been founded off the back of that entire scene. So, essentially, you're always a guest in these spaces and you always kind of act, you have to kind of move accordingly. And then from then on, I feel like I've done a good job in terms of like behaving well in these spaces just being a good kind of patron for the most part when I go on my own anyway I then tend to just keep myself to myself and just do my own thing if someone kind of talks to me or likes to cut off my jib or whatnot maybe I'll kind of say something cool but for the most part I tend to just do my own thing or if someone doesn't want to talk I just quickly move on whatever I don't really mind or bother anybody but I feel like there needs to be a wider conversation around that because I feel like some of the things you hear people say who are in that scene about how people should act people like myself i think can kind of come across a little bit uh what's it discriminatory but it, it can kind of come across a bit weird as if like everybody is on that sort of time um because i think some of the comments I, that i kind of read on people when we were kind of debating this in a group were really interesting which i kind of want to point out where is it let me just quickly pull one up here um we were debating the topic we were debating and then um somebody says and then somebody actually highlights something that i actually didn't know this let me rewind Somebody actually mentioned something that i never actually thought about if you're actually somebody that's from that community and from that scene you live that way and you're about that life and stuff right and they said as follows as basically as a queer person they said as follows bros just move different so bros just move differently half dare to get drunk so they what so they wobble or don't gently move through the crowd which is something i never thought about that bros move differently through the crowd even the way that they kind of try to get to the front and whatnot isn't graceful isn't considerate i'm assuming there's going to be a lot of like especially if you've got a nice dairy uh, girl or boy or whoever you identify i'm sure there's going to be a lot of kind of back arch kind of like sorry excuse me touching which I've never been a fan of. I always put my hands up in a flipping police dance before I'm putting this somewhere. I'd much rather, you know, get near the air and say, excuse me, like then touch them on their shoulders and stuff. I just think it's unnecessary to be touching people you don't know, but that's just me. So I just never thought that was cool. Um, it's one thing if you're flirting with somebody in the conversation and you want to, you know, um, create some sort of weird bond i don't know whatever you're some sort of flipping pickup artist thing you're doing all right but it's just some random person you're kind of behind them and you're touching them that's like the most creepiest thing ever but anyway, maybe it's just me we move on um it continues in the comment it said the other half of the men there or the bros are there to fuck and spend their time either doing coke in a bathroom or just getting too close to the ladies now that's funny because i felt like maybe because of the nature of the drug it maybe makes you a little bit way it maybe kind of depletes your your um how do you say it? what does coke do to you sometimes it sort of depletes your maybe your reasoning your level of reasoning you don't reason as well you kind of rush to conclusion you're always kind of like you know you maybe go to the nth degree and for some people it makes them incredibly horny but i'd imagine a lot of people that go to these sort of parties for the most part are really doing that gear anyway right you're probably on that sort of gear or maybe you're not maybe you're on ecstasy that maybe makes you more happy maybe you're on lsd maybe you're on mushrooms maybe you're on acid that kind of makes you a little bit more social maybe in your world i don't really know sorry pardon me for that one but the coke thing i didn't really understand why that's an issue for the bros only i imagine it's an issue for everybody especially with people in that scene because they do a lot of ghb and whatnot that i wouldn't assume is something that would make you the most uh friendly ever i don't know maybe i'm wrong it continues um 
doing coke and just want to be close to ladies. It says there's less grace when people bump into each other when it's broish. People being worried guys are hitting on them and giving them strange looks. And that's exactly what I mentioned in my Bergen story where I kind of inadvertently stared at somebody for way too long. I was just like admiring the scene of all these amazing people. And I just noticed, oh shit, there's all these topless girls in here. Oh shit, that guy's naked. Oh shit. Do you know what I mean? I was just noticing it. And I guess for the whatever moment, I, my eyes stared way too long. They caught my eye and they immediately started covering up. And I was like, damn, I've ruined it. Do you know what I mean? I've ruined their night because I've, I immediately reminded them that they were topless when they didn't actually even remember because they were in a safe space so i felt really bad about that and i kind of thought from down on i have to make sure that i don't do that even though you know my boy by boy my boy monkey brain is just looking boob 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 boobs just look you know you should just go in there basically willing to dance and kind of lose yourself in the music and not really think about those kind of things it continues here and then the person said obviously promoting the the fold night that they do on sundays which is called unfold which is usually a residence and friends family and friends sort of like let's say um party that they put on now because they've got their own residence party called resistance but essentially unfold i've always been raved about with people and i guess the reason why they rave about it to me is because they're from that scene and it's the most comfortable place to be at because usually on sundays you want to imagine a lot of bros will go there and also the parties are very much geared towards that community of people and it runs from like really early in the afternoon to like 12 a.m and that's it it continues um and another person says as follows i didn't really like uh which is the person i said in flum yeah this is a comment i didn't the one the one comment i didn't like was this comment someone said in the, in the group they said this follows they said um um in my risk because i think i said something like um uh, i agree with i don't know i just didn't like this comment what they said this says the follows i have plenty of straight guy friends who i go clubbing with who are, who would never be labeled as bros i've gone to nights like dyke energy with a couple of them it's just about actually dancing not leering being aware of how much space you take up to be honest i'm always most suspicious of big groups of straight guys like why are none of your mates women or queer most people who are cool have mixed group of friends which i just really take offense to because what it what it immediately assumes is that if you're if you're from that scene you're immediately queer that there isn't a square person that exists in the queer community which is in nonsense there are boring basic bitch type of people who are into the most normally average stuff in every kind of um subsect of society so to suggest just because you know, for the most part, they do have a stranglehold on the coolness, right? You don't get me wrong. There is a, all most of our cool vernacular probably does come from that scene, but let's be serious. Like, just because you're from that community doesn't mean you're cool. That just doesn't make any sort of sense. And this notion that just because there's a bunch of bros and they don't have any women or queer friends in their group that they're not exactly going to be down or cool or understand the scene is a little bit insulting too, I feel like. But it may be explains why places like Bergheim tend to always turn away b big groups of boys unless they're clearly you know unless they're clearly gay in that respect all right or identify as queer there is a real um tendency to turn away those groups of people in those kind of clubs and that might be the reason because they generally think for the most part if you don't have any people in your group that are from that community then generally you're not going to get what's going on inside you're going to make people uncomfortable and it just isn't a space for you just go somewhere else so you can kind of feel more free to do your thing because you're going to be freaked out by what's going on in there maybe that's the reason why but i feel like there needs to be a little bit more conversation is not maybe the right term maybe more communication maybe more understanding maybe more benefit of the doubt to get people to kind of meet them where they're at because unfortunately i feel like for them especially the um the queer lgbtq scene and whatever i'll term them as like the old scene in terms of nightlife i feel like unfortunately for them they've created something so successful so fun because literally i have the most fun i dance the most when i go to these community these community parties like there's no doubt like my shirt is soaking after going to those inferno events and going to flipping um events like uh Budokai events like Hishi Day. I didn't go to the festival that they put on. I forgot the name of the hit festival, but all these thing, events are the best events in London, hands down. That's why all the quote unquote cool people go to those kind of parties because they're much better than going to the standard club nights that you might get in the standard kind of club spaces. So I think unfortunately for these people, they they're creating a really great product. The word is spreading. People like myself are talking about it. Um, I'm in a, and I'm not in the community, even though I'm a part of the dance music community you'd say maybe or whatever it may be um i'm not exactly part of that scene scene i'm talking about it it's only getting bigger and bigger and they're gonna have they're gonna probably encounter more of these issues going forward and unfortunately we don't really have 
door picking policies even they, they they do enforce them in a lot of the kink nights i know like crossbreed and whatnot and club verboten they're really really strict about even if you buy a ticket doesn't mean you're guaranteed entry you have to abide by the dress code all that sort of stuff there's still a tendency in the uk that towards customers or punters feeling like if they bought a ticket they should be able to go in so it feels like there's going to be a little bit of an impasse being met in the future where they're going to have to maybe turn away a few people those people are going to get pissed off like how dare you turn me away and it it might end up being a situation kind of reflected with studio 54 that kind of you know was the beginning of the end of studio 54 when they sort of like were for the general public for the community and they started getting a bit too baked a bit too busy all the famous people went to come then more people went to come off the back of seeing the famous people at the club and then suddenly all the average joes that went there made it cool couldn't get in anymore and then that kind of was the beginning of the end of the of c54 according to the history books and whatnot so i hope that doesn't happen to this sort of scene in community but there is some rough sort of like guidelines here that i checked up on online courtesy of crossbreed they have a list of party rules that they have which might give an idea on what people should do like myself who you would describe as a raging straight male and people like my, and people who identify like myself and also want to go to these parties, maybe something you should keep in mind when you're going there um, to kind of make sure that you don't, you know, cause people um, any issues and you treat their space, you know, with respect and whatnot. So this is part of rules courtesy of Crossbreed, right? One of the kind of four leaders in terms of doing kink nights here in London. And there's a few others as well, like Club Verboten, I mentioned and a few more, but, you know, Crossbreed and Club of Birds are probably the top two out here. And their house rules as follows. Um, they said um, underneath the party rules, we hate rules that diminish our night to express ourselves and are firm believers that some rules are made to be broken. However, we want to create a party that enters the experience of queer and marginalized people. As such, it is necessary to create certain rules in in place so to have certain rules in place if you don't want to consider how your presence affects others in the space then don't buy a ticket so clearly they're sitting the you know they're kind of drawing the line there and basically letting you know what i want rule number one we are queer fetish party and you should dress accordingly you can also apply this to inferno to be honest you know i'm actually lucky that i get into inferno dressed the way that i am but it is pretty for the most part everyone does kind of go for it they don't mess around with the outfit sit flipping um crossbreed sorry uh, inferno and crossbreed crossbreed probably more but inferno definitely introverts and extroverts are welcome alike we just ask you to step out of the realm of social conformity as a general rule if you can't get out the if you can get out of the bus and not have people um, turn around in shock you probably won't get in entry will be denied to those who have hairstyles and outfits which are deemed to our team to be cultural appropriation wow i didn't know that strictly no fancy dress i like that and if you need to further inspiration there's plenty on our website and instagram no photos on the dance floor or in the play area please use wellness second sanctuary in bathrooms or smoking area to scroll instagram to text your friends that's another thing i know too about inferno and other places like that for as great as parties that they are for as many people who go out dressed with the most outlandish and forward thinking outfits and quote unquote crazy outfits that you would see there's a real lack of phones on the dance floor to the point where when i was recording some content that i kind of uploaded on my youtube i think you saw, saw some clips and stuff when i recorded those videos those were the max i could record the first couple of times i went i didn't know you couldn't record videos and immediately people were saying no I, some someone came in there to me who was a kind of wellness person hey people are getting freaked out that you're recording i was like oh, i'm just recording the party i'm not trying to record anybody and expose their details i was literally just pointing upwards and kind of cutting people's heads off and that was still an issue so for the most part, people don't even use their phones, even in a place where they kind of, you would imagine they would because they look all amazing and you imagine they want to, they'd have, want to you know, capture the moment and stuff. They're all just living in that moment and enjoying the rave, which is really, really impressive because it's very, some, it's very much so something that I kind of see a lot when I go to Berlin, right? It's something that's kind of normal. But in London, you, you know, for the most part, you go to most raves, everyone's kind of got their phone out waiting for the drop and to put on their Instagram stories and record shitty videos. So it's nice to see that being sort of like put in as a rule, like no photos on the dance, no pictures, no, no phone use on the dance floor, go to the side or whatever you may be on the toilet and use a phone, but don't do it on the dance floor. I love that. It says as follows. Um, we operate a strict no photos rule your phone's lenses will be covered upon entry our house photographer will be floating around if you would like your photo to be taken 
again asking permission they always ask consent beforehand if you don't want your image to be used on cross for commercial purposes please do not give comment sorry consent having a photo taken you may withdraw your consent at any time please just email us so clear open line of communication there in terms of pictures we have zero tolerance policy on harassment of any kind if you witness harassment of somebody that makes you feel uncomfortable please let one of our armband wearers know and we will deal with the perpetrator armband wearers will be wearing light up armbands and are all wonderful and welcoming so clearly again all that stuff being said out there arcs don't assume um sexual preferences or genders pronouns are one of the ways we live our identity try to introduce yourself with your own pronouns ask for someone's pronouns politely then introduce please respect something everyone and how he she they would like to be addressed which again something you have to get used to if you're not got used to going to sort of spaces we know it's a rave it gets hectic but don't deliberately touch anyone without consent don't push or bash people be courteous and kind no mean no which is something someone said in the chat which i didn't actually even realize that was an issue if you're somebody from that scene you're just not used to the bro sort of like energy or screaming because at the mixes or getting excited at a drop or people barging towards the front because people still people still barge at these parties it's not like they they're all sort of sliding through like michael jackson but it's just done with a little bit more grace you know what i mean another one says men please be aware of potential threat you pose to strangers do not assume that because you think you're a nice guy your presence won't make others feel uncomfortable or fearful which is something i've definitely had to kind of realize when i go to spaces like just to kind of that's why for the most part i think except for one occasion i've never actually got in the middle of the dance floor which is sad but anyway, it doesn't matter because i always dance my, my face off anyway but i always tend to stay on the outside perimeter usually when i go to inferno you'll see me sitting on the flipping chairs on the side it's just as you come in they've got these little fold out chairs i'll just sit there it's a bit weird because i look like i look probably even more leery there but i just feel like after after a while you don't want to i mean you don't want to keep excuse me excuse me and putting your hands up so I just sit there get my beer and just listen to people and if it, the music kind of pops off and i want to dance i just stand up and dance that space it's all well and good um but yeah that's what i've generally tried to do when i've kind of gone to spaces for myself to kind of make it you know comfy and stuff another one says here rule trans people regularly experience discrimination misgendering fetishization transphobia and microaggressions at crossbreed we center the trans and non-binary experience and want to create a safer space for trans people anybody interfering on the space infringe on the space will be removed again clear and to the point we are working too hard to include inclusive diverse anti-racist organization we want to create parties that are safer for bipoc people in order to do this we sent our experience of bipoc at cross breed races are strictly prohibited as it's a fetishization of black and non-black people of color if you are reported for racist behavior of any kind you will immediately removed from the party and banned if you don't fully adhere to the difference between having preference of fetishization someone it is not safe to attend the party and strongly suggest attending one of our workshops first and i like that they've got these workshops they do they've got these um what they call they got these socials they do on wednesdays as well so there's always an opportunity to learn there's always an opportunity to meet the community to get kind of used to it to dip your toes in a little bit and kind of get acquainted with it and also i think even though this is really kind of maybe over the top for some people it's a little bit um self not so self absorbed what's the, what's, the, what's the word when you're a little when you take yourself too seriously i forgot that term is I think what it does is that it turns off the people it's meant to turn off. That's a good thing about it. When you put these rules in place, how much they got? I'm not going to read all of them, but they've got like 14 rules here, right? And they're all pretty, you know, sternly writ written and clearly written. So there's no kind of vagueness involved in it. You know exactly what they said. They said what they said, right? Or I said what I said, whatever that term is. It does turn off the right people. The people who get annoyed by this and think this is too much, too many rules. It's not fun. It's not free. Um, I feel like you're telling me off, blah, blah, blah. I feel offended. I feel attacked you don't come and clearly they don't want you there and you're not the kind of person that would vibe with their crew anyway um so that kind of makes sense so this isn't this in a way even though like i said before we don't really have door picking culture in the uk this kind of is a good way to kind of be door picky because you set the precedent already with the instagram account with the photos, photos that they post up on there if you're not comfortable with the people you see on that feed you probably will be turned off and not go and maybe unfollow the account and then secondly they've got these rules that they put in place that they're always reminding people about code of conduct code of conduct party rules party rules so it's a real good way to sort of like set your stall out and make sure people know while going another point here number 10 says ableism of any kind will not be tolerated people um create spaces for people for people with disabilities be conscious of our community and very neurodiverse and that doesn't mean your behavior is wrong with that said neurodiversity is not an excuse for rule breakers to inappropriate behavior of any kind so clearly trying to make sure they kind of cater to everybody but yeah anyway loads of good, good rules on there to kind of point out that kind of way to kind of uh put out there for everybody that maybe would be attracted 
wanted to go to is kind of like that me identify themselves as straight and kind of maybe feel like they're not welcomed or feel as if their rules are a bit too constrained whatever not or maybe if you're from that scene you feel like the presence of straight people is maybe putting you off to go into these events in general i just feel like unfortunately you guys have created a great product it's just you create a great product people are going to want to come and attend it and i feel like in general if you want to grow and become a successful business anyway you're kind of going to have to sort of like accept cash from the normies or whatnot or from the people that are not exactly from the straights as they quote unquote so they maybe have to be a meeting in between to kind of get people to kind of align all together but um i don't know what do you think in the comments down below do you think this sort of stuff is necessary do you think it's overboard um do you as a person that identifies yourself as lgbtq or under the ban of lgbtq and queer do you sometimes get annoyed when people like myself attend your parties how can we do better to better acquaint ourselves in your scene so it doesn't come across like we're leering we're staring um we're objectifying we're being too big in our presence and man spreading and spreading our shoulders and being too bro and stuff how can we be better party patrons because we want to come to your parties i know for myself i want to come to your parties i want to dance because it's the only place i really get to dance close my eyes and sweat and leave with my front of my t-shirt soaked my back of my t-shirt soaked and my wallet absolutely empty your parties are sick i want to attend more but i also want to make sure that everyone this day doesn't feel like i'm invading on their space so how do i and others go about and do that properly is that possible even maybe it's not possible maybe it's just you know a lost cause and we have to kind of just leave you to what you do and you kind of you know leave us what we do which i don't like i, I don't like that separation or segregation i like everyone to kind of get along i know it's not going to be likely i know you know the boys that go and attend tech house raves are not probably going to go to a flipping porn sexual they're not going to go to a heron sooner i understand that but in an ideal world i would like there to be a bit more um collective unity personally for me the dance music scene but again i'm a i'm a flipping um i'm a little bit naive um i'm somebody that you know sees the the glass half empty or see the glass half full sorry um i mean i you know whatever that that's how i am in that kind of stuff I'm a little bit too positive and that sort of stuff because uh, i still see this dance music scene as an opportunity to create a even if it's a fake um or a temporary utopia but we can create some version of what we want society to be at large i mean we can do it and hopefully what we do can maybe be replicated in some ways possible in the wider society it's you know it's a bit it's a bit self-indulge and whatnot but you know what i mean hopefully hopefully that makes sense hopefully hopefully that makes sense um what else we'll talk about was i it? i think i might be it for now i know it's a little bit heavy on the flipping um talk with the clubs and stuff but hopefully it makes sense and you guys like it. and again i'll double back with all the other stuff that i went to speak about concerning um other things that maybe would be less clubby induced and probably tools other things that you guys might be more interested in, in terms of general cultural stuff oh last thing to talk about last thing 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 we have to talk about this because this happened just just now so obviously most of you are aware that the news just been confirmed that kim kardashian and pete davidson have broken up right so you know pop, pop out your violins wipe your tears away it's happened it's done it's over um it's maybe come a little bit sooner than i expected the way they were going on or the way they were acting was um that it was a really serious relationship they weren't going on it was just a hookup thing even though there were some embarrassing clips of kim basically telling pete to follow in a shower and shit you know, a bit cringe isn't it you're a 45 year old woman you got four kids no one cares how horny you get it's not really that cute it's not really that chic it just comes across a little bit cringe but again they're creating tv they're blockbuster tv in that respect so i get it i get it but they did carry themselves in a way where you would imagine a relationship would be a little bit more serious and long term you know i don't really see kim even though people say she's got crazy amount of bodies and stuff i don't really see that as an issue or a problem she's an attractive woman you know whatever it may be um you know live your life but I never really got the impression that she was somebody that would have random hookups. I always got the impression that she was somebody that kind of wanted boyfriends. I think the whole family's like that, right? They're sort of like, you know, whatever Chloe's going through with Tristan and Thomas at the moment in the news sort of like proves that they kind of want to maybe, maybe it's create, what hold on to whatever image of like a you know 2.1 family with like a house and a picket white picket fence and a dog and two kids they want that they want that solidity they want that family life they don't really want to be like single mums and shit or like out there in the streets so maybe that explains how they are as a family but in general i never got the impression kim was like you know a woman that kind of goes and sleeps with random people even though it's not a problem but i never got that impression so when i saw them together i just assumed he's the next guy he's the one that she's going to end up marrying after the fact because from what we know so far every dude that she's been super public with she ended up marrying in it right i don't know maybe i maybe maybe i'm wrong but it generally it's over and 
Kanye has been very adamant and very kind of vocal in his displeasure of his with his ex-wife at the time, separated wife, getting hooking up with Pete Davidson. Maybe because he felt like Pete was a friend and he felt like it was bro, against bro code or something. I don't know, but regardless, Kanye was never a fan of it. And I always find it really funny and a real sort of proof of his n narcissism that's on another level that he would be annoyed about it. Because if I'm not mistaken, when they were both, when they were both separated, he was the first person to be pictured out with somebody. That was, I think, um, Irina, what, Irina something, the, the woman that used to be engaged or with Cristiano Ronaldo, the Russian supermodel. I'm pretty sure Kanye was the first person to be pictured with somebody out in public that wasn't Kim. Um, and for whatever reason, he just, you know, exists in a world where there's one rule for him and one rule for others. He didn't feel like Kim should be with anybody. He felt like Kim should just, you know, have stayed with him or waited for him until he was ready to kind of recommit the way she wanted. I don't know, whatever. So when she ended up getting with P, he went on this tear online, basically doing what I think most people would want to do, but are probably too shy and embarrassed and have too much pride to do, where like you basically make it known that you're jealous of your ex-partner's new person and that you hope they break up and because you want your family back and you want your wife back. Under no circumstances will you ever be cool with them being with this person. There is no like, um, what's that word called? There is no like co-parenting thing with the other party being in a relationship. Nah, it's either me or no one. Do you know what I mean? You hope that other person dies in a car crash or in a plane. You know what I mean, you're wishing the worst on them. And I feel like Kanye was always sending that kind of energy. So when this Instagram post came up on his account, that's now been taken down, unfortunately, this epic Instagram poster that he put up, which I don't know who, I think maybe, hopefully he created it on his side, or maybe someone said it to him from, you know, the Kanye forums and whatnot. I don't know, but it's an incredible um, meme which essentially is a parody of the New York Times. And it's got as a headline, Skeet Davidson dead at 28. And at the bottom, which makes it even better, there's a little subtext that says, Kid Cudi meant to play funeral, but fearful of bottles throwers. Obviously, after what he went through at flipping and rolling loud. So clearly taking the opportunity to dance on Pete Davidson's grave and make it be known that he was never a fan relationship in a way in general. And I think it's funny because, like I said, I think most people would are thinking these sort of things most people who love somebody and especially if you have kids or somebody would like that you would probably have these feelings especially when it's so new the breakup you definitely have a feeling of like i can't get over this person already as a person right as somebody i was in a relationship with and now there's this other person that's involved especially if you're a dude you have this weird and possessive sort of thing in you where you feel as if like somebody else lying next to your wife is just a complete betrayal but at that point she's not really your wife and that you're separated but i don't know dudes have this weird possession thing when it comes to women but regardless you just take it as an affront you take it personally you think it's an insult to your manhood blah 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 blah, blah and you, you're never really cool with it the guys that are cool with it are fucking saints but for the most part most dudes aren't especially when it's new you kind of have to give it time maybe you get to know the person you see they're great with your kids then maybe you might simmer down but for the most part guys are never cool with it so i think he was just basically acting how most guys would act in a situation if they were Kanye West, if they have a billion dollars if no one if they if they had a reputation of just saying what they want you know, if they were known as being a little bit crazy, whatever it may be, they would say ex and do exactly what Kanye was doing with uh, Pete Davidson, what kind of doing Pete Davidson and Kim, I think, going forward. But it's hilarious. It's distasteful. It's done in bad, what do you call it? It's done in a, in a bad spirit. It's not something that you would really say is very Christian of him in general. But Kanye's not been afraid to say he's not the perfect Christian. He's a flawed individual. And he's always going to do what Kanye's going to do anyway. So it just is what it is. But I thought it was absolutely hilarious that they take the opportunity to really dance on, on Pete Davidson's grave. And some people are hypothesizing that this Skeet Davidson thing that he did then at 28 isn't him wishing death on Pete Davidson. It's actually him saying the name Skeet Davidson has now been put to bed or put to rest because he's no longer in Kanye's purview because, you know, the issue the relationship with Kim's over he only cared about calling him Skeet because he was with his ex-wife and you know he doesn't want anyone to touch his ex-wife because that's his wife that's the mother of his children so maybe he's saying hey the name Skeet's over one final kind of kick you know as you're down on the ground and of course he kind of kicked flipping Kid Cudi in the head too with the you know with the insult of the bottle throwing thing so clearly there's still issues going on there behind the scenes but yeah 
whatever the hype, whatever the theory is, I thought it was fucking hilarious. It was a great meme, great, great times as well in terms of the announcement um, just happening maybe a day before or maybe it was on the same day. I'm not really sure the, the timeline, but regardless, Kanye is an absolute legend. I love the pettiness of it and love the fact that he's not afraid to wear the pettiness on his shirt as he should because if you've got a few money, you should be doing a few things like I've said before on this podcast many times people would fuck you money don't say fuck you enough and Kanye just keeps saying fuck you to society and fuck you to the general decorum that we kind of all live and abide by because we have to and just does his own thing and I absolutely love it I absolutely love it Anyway, that has been the Excellent Digger Show, episode number 593. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time checking out my show, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, you'll hear a nice little tune of the day. I think the tune of the day, you know where it's going to come from. It's going to come from the Calvin Harris um, Funk Waivers Volume 2, whatever it's called, Funk Bounce, blah, 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 whatever the term is, right? the album title. You'll hear that coming up soon. And if you're watching via YouTube, you won't hear anything, unfortunately, because I don't want to get copyright striked. But thanks again for tuning checking me out. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be well. Peace.